Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Felder. Okay, it's good to have all of you back here. My, it's the fourth program and almost no one has left. This is good. Appreciate all your folks staying all afternoon. For you out in television, again, we just want to welcome you to an informal Bible study. Uh, we trust, we have no ax to grind, we don't attack anybody, we just simply teach the Word, and uh, we trust the Holy Spirit certainly has been and will continue to just open the eyes of a lot of people. Because, uh, oh, I had a letter the other day that uh, I would like to read in the program, but Iris and Laura thought, she said, no, people will think you're bragging, and I don't want to read them with that idea at all. But um, the lady was 94 years old, been in church all her life, and uh, just through our program, she suddenly realized that she had never experienced salvation. She had never understood the Scriptures, had read it through from Genesis to Revelation. But uh, that's just typical. And uh, the only reason I thought I wanted to read it is to let people know that uh, if, if, if you're experiencing this, you're not alone. We've got people from all walks of life, from all different backgrounds, that are suddenly seeing the Scriptures for well, not what I say, but for what the scripture. In fact, I had one gentleman call from Florida just yesterday. He says, Les, he said, you know what brought me out of darkness into the light? It wasn't what you said. It was the scripture that you had on the screen. And, uh, and I don't forget that. It's the word of God that is powerful. It isn't what I say or anything like that. And hopefully all I can do is point out what the scriptures say. And so even now, as we're still in our fourth program on James 1.1, I'm still trying to introduce the setting for these little epistles at the end of our New Testament that are addressed to Jews who were believers only in Jesus as the Messiah, and it was preparing them for pressure. Now, I trust you've opened up to James 1.1, even though we're not going to stay here. But uh, let's just go look at it a minute again. James 1.1, 1, 1, for the sake of our television viewers, that he is the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's writing to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. In other words, they're not in Jerusalem anymore. They've been scattered out. And as I pointed out in an earlier program, it was because of Saul's persecution. And we'll be seeing that hopefully in this next half hour. All right, but then you drop down the purpose for his writing this letter is more or less headlined in verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse... Now, the word temptations is unfortunate. I trust that maybe the newer translations... Does anybody have testing in your Bible? Okay, that's what it really should be. It wasn't temptation to sin, but it was the, tempt, the testing of persecution. Now again, like I told you in one of the earlier programs, some people think these letters are written to Jews contemporary with the writers, early Jewish believers recently scattered out of Jerusalem, which is certainly apropos. But many think that these letters are written to Jews who would be believers during the seven years of tribulation. Well, I say it's both. Because, you see, these Jews scattered throughout the Roman Empire were certainly under horrible persecution from their own people as well as from the pagan world. But it's also going to be a time of testing for Jewish believers who find themselves in the tribulation. So remember that these little Jewish epistles at the back are written primarily to encourage Jewish believers under pressure under the pressures of persecution and hatred. And uh, when you look at the two possibilities, and that's why I've been putting this, it's not up there anymore, they erased it again. <laughs> I'm gonna have to redraw it again because I'm not gonna let anybody get away without seeing what I'm trying to show on a timeline. And that is that all of the Old Testament prophecies come right down the pipe, one right after the other, with no hint of a 2,000 year interruption. Consequently, every portion of Scripture except Romans through Philemon will be directed to this timeline. I better get it up here so that when I'm pointing at it, you know what I'm talking about. So, uh, 
Now, I don't blame the guys for putting this up here because, like I said in the first program or the second program, you know, this is what the television audience is looking for. And if all of a sudden they didn't see that what belongs up here, they're going to call and say, well, what happened? And uh, so I'm going to put it back up here once again. And uh, hopefully you'll all remember now that after the call of Abraham, 2000 B.C., and we have 2000 between Abraham and Christ's first coming of the Old Testament, which is Jew only, with some exceptions, of course, Nineveh and Rahab and so forth, all preparing the nation of Israel for the coming of their Messiah. All right, so he comes and presents himself to the nation of Israel in his three years of earthly ministry, but in spite of all the miracles and wonders and signs, they crucified him anyway, but God raised him from the dead, called him back to the Father's right hand, Psalms 110, verse 1. And then as we saw in the last program, according to Psalms 2, shortly after that would come the seven years of wrath, or as we call it, the tribulation. Then Christ would return to the Mount of Olives and set up his kingdom, promised to Israel, and Israel could be priests of Jehovah, and they in turn could reach out to the Gentile world. Now that's the whole Old Testament program in a nutshell. The call of Abraham after the 2,000 years between Adam, the flood, the Tower of Babel, the call of Abraham. The nation of Israel coming up to King David at 1,000 B.C. And now under the law, Jesus comes and presents himself for three years, crucified, raised from the dead, gone back to glory, and then would come the seven years of wrath and vexation. Then he would return and set up the kingdom. Consequently, we have, as we saw in our last program, come back with me now then to uh, Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, I think that's where we left off where Peter now is appealing to the Jews of his day, shortly after Pentecost, remember, to repent of having rejected their Messiah because he was alive, he had now gone back to the Father, and that he was ready to return and yet bring Israel the kingdom. But there was one other item that he had to cover. Acts chapter 3 <coughs> Let's repeat where I left off, verse 19 and 20. So Peter says to these, where does he call it? Ye men of Israel, up in verse 12. Ye men of Israel. Verse 19, repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out and the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Now, that's not a period. It's a semicolon. So the thought goes right on into verse 20. The times of refreshing would come when God would send Jesus Christ. Now, remember, where is he? He's at the Father's right hand. Where would God send him? Back to Jerusalem to fulfill the Old Testament prophecies. All right, so he will send Jesus Christ, who was before preached unto you. But now verse 21, Peter says, but it can't happen tomorrow because first heaven must receive or hold until, time word, the times of restitution of all things. In other words, Jesus couldn't just return to the world as it was. He couldn't return to that and set up his kingdom. So what does he have to do? He has to regenerate it first. He has to cleanse the planet in order for the kingdom to be set up. And now that's why the, the wrath and vexation is that period of seven years in which God will deal in wrath and judgment on mankind but also to cleanse the planet of all of the stuff that man has brought into the picture and make it ready for his kingdom. 
Now, you know, you've heard me allude to this on the program many, many times. By the time we get this glorious heaven on earth scenario, what has to happen to all the garbage that's on the planet now? It has to go. I don't know how God's going to do it, but it's going to go. And I've used this illustration over and over. In all of our travels lately, and you all know it, there's construction, construction, construction. Men are busy as a colony of ants. And every time I go by one, and I've used this illustration before, I can't help but think of my going over a hill of ants with my hay machine and just literally smatter that ant hill to smithereens. Well, that's what God's going to do with all of man's activity. Oh, they're building and they're building and they're... And they have to. I'm not saying that. But nevertheless, it's, it's, a, it's just an act of futility because the day is coming when God is going to cleanse the planet of all this stuff. Now, if you think I'm, I'm stretching the envelope, as they say lately, just stop and think. Can God have all these nightclubs and these discos and these gambling casinos in his kingdom? No way. Can he have all the, the houses of prostitution and the bars and you name it in his kingdom? No way. Is he going to have all these multitudes now of ungodly, wicked people in his kingdom? No way. So what do I have to do? They're going to have to go. It's going to have to go. There's going to be peace in the Middle East someday, someday. Absolutely there's going to be peace when he returns. And there'll be no argument because he's going to be king of kings and lord of lords. But all the rest of that stuff's going to go. You know, I, I shock people. And uh, if you think I'm, I'm stretching the point since I'm on that very concept, come back with me to Jeremiah 25 once again. We've done it in our Oklahoma classes until I think they see it in their sleep. And well, they might, but Jeremiah 25. <clears throat> Jeremiah 25, verse 30. And this is exactly what Peter is talking about in Acts chapter 3. Now, as you're looking it up, let me read the verse in Acts 3 again in your hearing. Whom heaven must receive as he is ascended and sat down at the Father's right hand, whom heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things. Now, what does restitution speak of? Well, the same thing as regeneration. And when you regenerate something, what do you do? You make it like it was in the beginning. When you reconstitute something, what do you do? You make it like it was in the beginning. When you restore something. Now, my oldest son and his son are, you know, they're getting interested in, in restoring old cars and stuff like that. They're not actually doing it, but they like to read about it. And I like to restore, read about restored tractors and stuff like this. Don't you, Bill? Yeah. Oh, it's interesting. And what do they do? They take an old piece of junk that they find out someplace and they take it into their shop and they restore it until it's just like when it was brand new. Now, that's restoration. All right, that's what Paul is talking, or Peter is talking about in restitution. It's going to be made like it was in the beginning. Regeneration, like it was in the beginning. Now, how is he going to make it like it was in the beginning unless he cleanses the planet of everything that's here? All right, now, this is Jeremiah 25. This is what he's talking about. This is going to happen. Start at verse 30. Therefore, prophesy. See, this is prophecy. This is telling Israel what's coming in their future. Prophesy thou against them all these words and say to them, The Lord shall roar from on high. What's that a reference to? His second coming. His second coming. Like we saw a few programs back. He's going to stand on the Mount of Olives. All right? The Lord shall roar from on high and utter his voice from his holy habitation. He shall mightily roar upon his habitation, that is, this old planet. He shall give a shout as they that tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. 
That's what the book says. That's not my idea. I'm not interpreting. That's what it says, that he's going to crush the inhabitants of the earth like those who treaded the grapes in the grape vat. All right, read on. Verse 31, a noise shall come even to the ends of the earth, not just the Middle East. It's going to be around the globe. For the Lord has a controversy with the nations. Why? They've rejected him out of hand. And he will plead with all flesh. He will give them that are wicked to the sword. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, verse 32, Behold, evil shall go forth from nation to nation. Are you seeing it tonight? I don't care where we go. You pick up their daily newspaper, it's all the same. Nothing but murder and rape and robbery, and it's awful. Well, and I've always said America is still head and shoulders morally above the rest of the world. So can you get a picture of the world's moral climate today? Awful. All right. Evil shall go forth from nation to nation. Now, here comes the effects of his second coming. A great whirlwind shall be raised up from the borders of the earth, and the slain of the Lord shall be at that day, his second coming, the end of the seven years. And the slain shall be at that day from one end of the earth, even to the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented. There be no funerals, neither gathered nor buried. They shall be as dung upon the ground. And that's why the birds of prey will be called in to clean up the flesh. That's what's coming. And the world goes on their may or merry way as if they're going to rejuvenate it and make it themselves. No, they're not. They'll just keep making a bigger and a bigger mess every day. The politicians can try all they want. And I've always said it on this program. I'll say it again. The Democrats aren't going to make it right. The Republicans aren't going to make it right. Nor will anybody else until Christ returns. All right, back to Acts chapter 3. We've got to move quickly. So Peter, here just shortly after the day of Pentecost, we're probably back in, uh, oh, maybe 30 A.D. now. But he's still preaching repentance and water baptism, you know, to the nation of Israel to repent of their sins. All right, read verse 21 again now in light of what we have just read, whom heaven must receive or hold, until the times of restitution of all, of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the ages began. That's why I took you back to Jeremiah. All right, now then verse, oh goodness, let's go down to verse 24. Yea, Peter says, all the prophets from Samuel and those who followed after, as many as have spoken, have foretold, prophesied these days. Well, now remember, Peter isn't talking about 2000 A.D. Peter is speaking in about 30 A.D., and he's expecting all this to come within the next few years. So that within a matter of 10 or 20 years, Christ will be ready to return and set up the kingdom. That's all Peter knows. He knows nothing of 2,000 years of what we call the age of grace. All right, so read on now. All the prophets have spoken of these days, and then verse 25. This isn't church language. He says, you are the children of the prophets. Well, I've always made the point, to whom was all prophecy directed? Israel. Not to the Gentile world. Israel. Now, as prophecy is fulfilled on Israel, the whole Gentile world will get involved, of course. All right, so he said, you are the children of the prophets. And of the covenant which God made with our fathers, when he said unto Abraham, In thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. What's he talking about? When he'd return and set up this glorious kingdom promised to Israel, in which there will be Gentiles, of course. They're going to survive and they're going to be in the kingdom. All right, so now the setting then is, is getting closer and closer for the coming of the Messiah after the horrors of the seven years of tribulation. 
But years are going by, and Peter and the eleven, as well as the other six that were appointed, are pleading with the nation to yet repent and believe that this Jesus whom they crucified was the Christ. And years have been going by, and they've been preaching their hearts out. All right, now then you come all the way to Acts chapter 7. And now we have one of the six that were chosen besides the twelve. And this is Stephen, who wasn't one of the twelve. He was one of the six that were chosen to wait on tables, remember. All right, but now Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, is going to make one last appeal to the nation of Israel. God is using this man, who was not one of the twelve, but one of the six, to make a last appeal to the nation of Israel. All right? We're not, again, going to take it all verse by verse, but we'll just hit the highlights. So, verse, let's see, where can I take you? Up to Acts chapter 6. Verse 15. Acts chapter 6, verse 15. And all that sat in the council. What council? The religious leaders of Israel. All the religious leaders of Israel are now sitting here in judgment on this man, Stephen. All right? And they looked steadfastly on him, and they saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Verse 1 of chapter 7, Then said the high priest, Are these things so? In other words, what they were accusing him of. And he said, Men, brethren, and fathers. How many Gentiles would a Jew call his father? Not a one. And so Stephen is addressing Jews. And he goes all the way, as Paul does himself, back, I think, in chapter 22. He goes all the way back to Abraham and again reviews the history of Israel and how God, step by step, was bringing them to the place where he could present their Messiah and their King. All right, let's go all the way up to the end of his message. And, uh, oh, let's go in chapter 7, verse, oh, let me see, 51. Oh, I sometimes don't know where to jump in the best. But Acts chapter 7, verse 51, Stephen is now ending up. And remember, he's addressing the, the elite of Israel. And he says, You stiff-necked, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost or the Spirit as your fathers back in history. So do ye. For which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them who showed before the coming of the just one. And it's the just one of whom you are now the betrayers and murderers. Verse 54, when they heard these things, they, this elite again of Israel, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. They gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, Stephen, being full of the Holy Spirit, looked up steadfastly in the heavens, saw the glory of God, saw Jesus standing, not seated, saw him standing on the right hand of God. And wow, that threw fear into those Jewish leaders. Because what verse did they know better than their name and address? Psalms 110, 1. Come sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And they understood that when God would subject his enemies to the rule and reign of the Son of God, then he would be able to set up his kingdom. And they saw it. They saw it. He's not seated. He's standing. What does that mean? He's ready to come. He's ready to pour out his wrath and judgment. And in their fear, I think, 
And in their nonsensical reaction to that, what'd they do? Look at the next verse. They cried with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran upon him with one accord. Now that was conviction supreme. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen. And he, verse 60, kneeled down and cried a loud voice, Lord, lay not this into their charge. When he said this, he fell asleep. Now, verse 1 of chapter 8, we have a complete change in the personalities of the book of Acts. Saul of Tarsus. All right, and Saul was consenting unto his death. All right, now, as far as we've come, as far as we've come, all the way up through Christ's earthly ministry, <coughs> He was rejected, but God rose him from the dead, <clears throat> called him back to the right hand of the Father, <clears throat> waiting for the day when he could return and yet set up his kingdom. So in this period of time, we now know that it was more like, uh, oh, let's see, uh, 29 to 37, almost seven, eight years in here, when Peter and the eleven plus the six, like Stephen, are pleading with the nation of Israel to yet accept the fact that the one they crucified was their Messiah because they could see all the ramifications of the wrath and vexation coming and they were to be ready for the coming of the king and his kingdom. And so everything that they preach and plead is on this basis. But as we get to where we are right now, all of a sudden, God moves in with a whole new character, Saul, who will become Paul. And he's going to send him where? To the Gentiles. All right. Now, I haven't got time. We'll have to do it in our next program. But when we come back next month, we're going to draw the second timeline that shows how this prophetic line is now going to be totally stopped right there. All this will be pushed out into the future, and we're going to come into a parenthetical period of time of 2,000 years where God is going to be dealing with the Gentiles instead of Israel. <clears throat> Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures, and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding.